My name is John Weaver. I've been working with Muslims for 30 years now. I got started in refugee ministry in Nashville, Tennessee in 1991. And in 1998, I moved to Central Asia. So I've lived in Afghanistan for many years, and I got married there, and now I'm here in the United States with our five children, and we're involved with various organizations, Samaritan's Purse and others, and resettling Afghan families here in the United States. Well, most of you would remember on 9-11, God opened up Afghanistan to the world, and many people went there to serve the people of Afghanistan. Well, now we're 20 years removed from 9-11, and sadly, in August of 2021, as you know, the Taliban took full control of Afghanistan, and as a result of that chaos and the tyranny and the fear that's gripped millions of people in Afghanistan, tens of thousands of them have escaped. Our American government has been very influential in helping tens of thousands of them evacuate to the United States. And so now here we are as citizens of the United States in a unique opportunity to welcome tens of thousands of Afghans that God has brought here for us to serve them, to welcome them, to resettle them. And our passion as Christ followers to share the love of Jesus uh, with them. So reminder that Afghanistan is the heart of Central Asia. So just remember, Afghanistan's not really in the Middle East. It's in Central Asia. It's surrounded by countries like Iran and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, which were part of the former Soviet Union. And it's also bordered to the east by China and Pakistan. So it's in the center of Central Asia. The people are called Afghans or the joke, you know, pecan, pecan, some might say Afghan, some might say Afghan, but the people of Afghanistan are called Afghans. It's a tribal society, uh, so you might have Afghan friends that are from a Pashtun tribal background, or a Tajik background, or Hazara. There's different ethnic groups in Afghanistan, but similar to here in the United States, where we would all say we're Americans, even though we might come from different ethnic backgrounds, in Afghanistan, it's the same thing. There's different tribes and ethnicities, but all the people would say, we are Afghans. Now, most all Afghans are born into a Muslim family, so they're growing up with an Islamic worldview. It's Eastern culture. It's a shame and honor culture. So there's many aspects of their life that would be very different to our American cultural here. So I want to remind us that our Afghan neighbors have been through a lot to get here. Remember in their, cult their country, as you might know, there's been a lot of civil war, a lot of fighting, a lot of invasions, a lot of tribal conflict, the tension between Sunni and Shia Muslims. So our Afghan neighbors have been through a lot. So the most loving thing that we can uh, do for them, maybe learn salam, which is a way to greet them, maybe learn some of their language. But as Christ followers, the most loving thing we can do for them is to welcome them in love, to serve them, to get to know them, to learn their names, to learn their story, to be good listeners. It's almost like imagine you were going to go to Afghanistan. Think of things you would do to prepare yourself for that. Well, now God has brought Afghanistan to us. You don't need a plane ticket. You don't need any more immunizations. So what would be some things that we would do? Well, we would learn a little bit about Afghanistan. We would learn a little bit about Afghan culture and Afghan language to prepare ourselves to minister to them. Well, now they're coming to our doorsteps. So let's do that as well. In humility, let's be a servant and a learner and learn about their country, about their culture and about their language so that we can receive them in the most loving way as followers of Jesus. So some of the unique cultural differences from a Afghan culture to American culture or Eastern culture to Western culture, well, some are some obvious things that in Eastern culture, it's more community oriented, it's more relationship oriented. The identity is in the group. Whereas here in America, our identity is more uh, individual identity. 
Uh, there's some other cultural differences because they're coming from an Islamic Muslim uh, perspective or worldview. And so you may have heard the word halal and haram. So halal is acceptable behavior or acceptable practices. And haram is, of course, things that aren't acceptable. So, for example, I know many of you love to eat bacon for Saturday morning breakfast. Well, if I'm an Afghan coming from a Muslim perspective, I don't eat pork because I see that as haram. It's almost like the Jewish Old Testament, you know, cultural uh, traditions. And so there are a lot of things that would be different religiously speaking, like haram and halal. Uh, but there's going to be some differences like in gender. In Afghan culture, it's very general, gender specific. So it's more men with men and women with uh, women. That's going to be another unique uh, difference. And there's going to be a lot of other little nuances like for an Afghan family, they normally would sleep together in one room. And so some of the things we do as individuals, maybe they've never slept in a bed before. Maybe they've never slept in a room by themselves uh, before. Some of the things we value like time and money and the decision making processes that we do as, as individuals, they're going to be a little bit slower in processing and making decisions because of the shame and honor culture. So there are some differences. We're going to give you some resources, hopefully, that might help you better understand some of those cultural differences, too. Yeah, how do we respond to questions that they ask? This is a very, very good question. Remember, Christ, though he was in the very nature of God, he humbled himself and became a servant. So we want to have this posture of humility and being a servant, even in the spiritual exchange that we have with them. So one helpful thing that we've learned is simply saying, Wow, Aziz, thanks for asking that question. So we acknowledge we heard the question. That's a great question. Help me understand what do you mean by that question to get a little bit more clarity and to even have a little bit of time to think about what our response would be to show we're interested in what they're feeling or what they're thinking or their viewpoint before we, you know, just quickly, you know, we're quick people as Americans. We, we quickly, you know, jump in, you know, with the answer. So we've learned the hard way. Just to pause, you know, slow down, and when they ask a question, say, thanks for asking that question. Help me understand what do you mean by that question. And then some things we've learned that are helpful. You can tell a story. You can use a parable. You can say an example from your own life, meaning sometimes it's more fruitful instead of just saying yes or no to kind of say a statement or a parable, or a story, or a scripture in the Bible, or say, oh, that reminds me of something, and then you share that, because we want to build a bridge. In every conversation, we want to build a spiritual bridge so that we can communicate truth and give them something to think about uh, with them in a way that's more understandable and more effective coming from their cultural viewpoint. Some of the aspects of our American culture that might be very challenging to our new Afghan neighbors, one of them is going to be the aspect of time. So here, time is so important. Time is money. At times, we'll even, <laughs> say, we'll even say that. So that's going to be a challenge for our Afghan, our Afghan neighbors uh, because for them, time's not the most important thing. People are more important than time. Family's more important than time. The shame and honor aspects of their culture are more important to time. Building relationships are more important to time. And yes, we know we need money to live, but in an Afghan culture that's primarily been a survival society and where you live off the land, that's going to be a big challenge for them when they see here in American culture money is very, very important. And sometimes people are driven based on money or they make decisions uh, based on money. Those are going to be some, just the busyness of our life here. Now, that doesn't mean that all Americans are living a busy life, but in general, the busyness of life here in American culture is going to be a challenge for our, our Afghan neighbors who are far more relational. We've even reminded people, it's almost like if you could imagine 200 years ago, Stories you might heard your grandparents or great-grandparents talk about how life was here hundreds of years ago. It was much more relational focus, much more family-oriented. You knew your neighbors. In fact, the word 
for neighbor in the Afghan language of Dari is the word hamsoya, and it means to share the same shadow. It's like the idea of here's the trees in our neighborhood or here's the trees in our yard, and those of us who share the same shadow, uh, we, are, we are neighbors. And so these are going to be some challenges for our Afghan neighbors when they realize we're an Western culture, time is so important, money is so important, the busy pace of life uh, that we have as Americans is going to be a big challenge for them. Just some reminders of some basic do's and don'ts as you're signing up and volunteering and giving yourself to help resettle our new Afghan neighbors. Well, first of all, pray for them. Begin the ministry of prayer even today, even uh, right now. Let's learn a little bit about their culture, about the perspective they're coming from as Muslims. And some of those basic do's and don'ts would be this. If they're going to come to my house, I'm not going to serve pork because that's not the most loving thing to do. Now, I don't drink alcohol. I know many Christ followers do. We're free in Christ in that regard. I don't want to make that an issue. But if you have alcohol in your home, a basic do and don't is... Please don't serve alcohol, and please put that in a place where it's out of sight, out of mind, because our experience is that will affect your, wis- uh, your, affect your witness. It won't be a bridge builder. It'll be a bridge breaker, and so that's something to, to keep in mind. When you get the opportunity to bring out the Word of God, our encouragement is have a copy of the Scriptures that's not marked up, that's not written on, because that's just one reminder that you know, the Bible that I read, I, I show that to Christ fathers that I'm discipling, and they say, wow, he loves the Word of God. But if we show the Word of God that has all our writings and our notes to our fellow Muslim Afghan neighbors, they see it as disrespectful or dishonoring to God. So the basic do and don't would be, yes, get the Scriptures available to them, but make sure if you're going to give them the Bible, it's a new Bible, it's not marked up, Or if you're going to show the scriptures to them in a spiritual conversation, it's wise to use a scripture that's not all marked up so that that doesn't become a sensitive issue or a barrier uh, in the spiritual uh, conversation uh, with them. And do ask them spiritual questions. Ask them about their family. Ask them about their journey. Be a good listener. Those of you who might have the privilege of welcoming them into their home or even helping them set up their home or doing even some of that before they get there, keep in mind they're coming from a survival society, so less is best. We would say don't decorate the home with a lot of things. Keep it simple. Keep in mind even many of them have never even slept in a bed before. They just have little floor mattresses. So in that case, we would say a basic do and don't is Don't go elaborate in setting up the house. If you can ask them or involve them in the process, that's probably helpful because they're going to know what's uh, best for them and for their their family. And um, just some basic things about food. They love rice. They love tea, green tea, black tea. Often they'll put sugar in it. So if you are going to give a warming gift, a housewarming gift, any type of fruit, almonds, any type of nut, you know, any type of uh, you know, tea or sugar, all of those items are welcomed and received graciously, and they're all halal, meaning they're all acceptable. And so just some basic reminders, again, thinking about the questions of do's and don'ts. So as we think about being spiritually effective among our new Afghan neighbors who are coming from a Muslim background, this is something we seriously want you to consider, prayerfully consider. It might not be best to quickly invite them to church. Now, please hear my heart on this. Something that we've learned the hard way, relationship is by invitation. And sometimes we've learned the hard way, the best time to introduce something is when they initiate it. So now if your Afghan friends are talking about church and they're expressing interest that they would love to come to church with you, that's different. But in terms of evangelism and sharing the gospel and making disciples among them, our first response is probably not to invite them to church. And it's because of, stop and think, the journey they're coming from, there's going to be a lot of linguistic or language barriers and misunderstandings. There's going to be a lot of cultural barriers and cultural misunderstandings. And sadly, there are even stories where new friends or refugees that are here in the States 
They have gone to a local church and then actually it became a hindrance because of all the language barriers and misunderstandings and because of all the cultural barriers and cultural misunderstandings. So our suggestion would be, let's first receive them into our lives. Let's welcome them into our families. Let's practice hospitality. You know, hey, fellow pastors, I'm, I'm ordained pastor as well. You realize one of the requirements of being an elder is to practice hospitality, to be, to be hospitable. And I know we do that in our culture at a restaurant, but I want to encourage all of us, let's open up our homes first to our new Afghan neighbors, invite them into our homes, engage spiritual conversations that way, pray with and for them that way in the, in the safety and the, the, the bridge building relational aspect of our home. And then maybe down the road, we might be able to invite them to church or they might express interest in coming to our church. But our experience is evangelism, discipleship is going to be relational. It's going to be more in the context of building a relationship with them. There's no need to fear. There's no need to be worried. God is sovereign. God is in control. God is at work among them. And God is the one who's bringing them to our doorstep so that we can love them in his name and share his word with them. So as someone who's had the privilege of serving in Afghanistan and seeing the difficulties and the challenges of doing spiritual ministry there, I want to remind you of the unique opportunity right before you that God has brought right to your doorstep, right to your own neighborhood, right to your own local church. Some of these Afghan neighbors are some of the most unreached people in the world. People that have probably never met a Christ follower, may have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel, and may would not have had the opportunity to hear the gospel and meet a fellow Christ follower had God not allowed all this to happen and brought them to our doorstep. So brothers and sisters, there's no need to fear. The Lord responds to that saying, fear not, I am with you. Fear not, I am with you to the very end. And fear not, I have all authority in heaven and earth. What a unique responsibility this is for us as the church, as the body of Christ, to partner with Samaritan's Purse and other like-minded ministries, to be missional, to be intentional, and to make disciples among some of the most unreached people on the planet. And remember, Jesus is worthy of their worship. He's worthy of their, our lives and their lives because he shed his blood to redeem them from every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue. What if completing the Great Commission is us embracing this unique opportunity God's put right in front of us to welcome our Afghan neighbors and to make disciples among them? In Jesus' name.